like to introduce the speakers and very briefly, Professor Jeffrey Lesser is the director of the Halle, Halle or Hale? Halle. Halle Institute of Global Research at Emory University and a member of the Institute for Advanced Studies at the University of Sao Paulo. Boa tarde. É, como a professora Cláudia, gostaria de agradecer o convite e apresentar minha pesquisa atual para vocês e parabenizar todo mundo aqui para esse evento fantástico e para a criação do centro aqui em São Paulo. É, minha apresentação tem duas partes. A primeira eu vou falar em inglês e a segunda em português. Eu vou fazer isso para todo mundo ter o grande prazer ouvir meu sotaque <risos> em várias línguas, tá? Então, é, então vou começar em inglês, se vocês uh, me permitem. Amelia Marino shot herself through the heart on a tenement on Italian Street in the Bon Retiro neighborhood of Central São Paulo em 1913. Marino was born in Italy had remigrated to Brazil from Argentina with a two-year-old child and was living in a estado matrimonial with a Syrian newcomer. For residents of the textile-dominated, ethnically diverse neighborhood, whose population of about 30,000 remains stable to this day, the story was sad but conventional. For health policymakers, health care workers, the police, and the media, Marino's suicide was yet another example of the explosive link between health and immigration. More than a century later, another young woman committed suicide in Bon Chiro, this time by jumping in front of a train. The discussion by the police, the media, and the National Health Service, SUS, medical team that I've been embedded in with the, for the last five years, showed striking similarities to the Marino case, focusing on questions of national origin, gender, generation, and relationship status. These two stories remind us that conviviality and inequality are part of a regular quotidian discourse in people's real lives. They remind us that perhaps the most problematic word for academics in our research is the word or, because it creates boxes, that instead we have to think about the and. My methods in this project, which I'll discuss over the next few minutes, seek to allow us to see conviviality and inequality as part of the same discussion, not as a one or the other. It suggests uh, continuity over time, which for the historians in the audience isn't the way we always do it. Sometimes we focus on change, but I'm interested in this project, in continuities. I see over and over again in my research that Brazilians who have never heard of Sergio Buarque de Holanda constantly express the importance of conviviality, never act on that expression in their daily acts, and regularly link inequality in their lives both to conviviality and the opposite of conviviality, often in the same conversations. Understanding the symbiotic and intertwined relationship allows, in my project, the ability to use humanities-based research on the past, I'm a historian, to improve the present through practical application. Bon Chiro, it's not very far from here. We can walk there in 30 minutes if we want to take a field trip. It's similar to immigrant neighborhoods throughout the world, from Atlanta's Buford Highway to Buenos Aires Once to Hamercaz in Tel Aviv. It has and had an outside, outsized role in the creation of Brazilian health policies because of the attention its large foreign populations have attracted from policymakers, the media, and the public. Even as physical well-being in the neighborhood has improved over the last 150 years, old diseases like tuberculosis, typhoid, and cholera persist, and new diseases like crack addiction and HIV have emerged. Regular flooding today, like 150 years ago, 
and the resulting standing water make mosquito-borne illnesses chronically relevant. Today, as they did a century ago, health professionals go by foot to packed tenements, unregulated sweatshops, tenements que dizer cortiso, unregulated sweatshops que dizer oficina, and factories in order to identify diseases and provide care. By combining historical research, contemporary field work embedded in the Brazilian National Health Services medical team, and spatial analysis, my current research distinguishes between public health and the public's health. I treat public health as primarily a project of formal institutions like governments, hospitals, and universities that create policies and train and regulate professionals. So all the people who work in the posto de saúde, they are part of public health. In Brazil, public health often reproduces broad gender, class, and racial hierarchies, even as it is presented as a state gift to the population. Today, as in the past, physicians are overwhelmingly male, overwhelmingly of European descent, and overwhelmingly from elite backgrounds. Nurses and non-medically trained healthcare workers, in contrast, are generally female, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, and self-identify across a wide and ever-changing spectrum of both racial, ethnic, and gender categories. Virtually all the people who work in public health are monolingual in Portuguese, and thus immigrant patients represent a particular challenge. I use the term the public's health, on the other hand, to represent the multiple way that real people, patients, express ideas and undertake actions related to diseases and cures. Sometimes the public's health is organized, for example, during the famous early 20th century Revolta da Vacina, vaccine revolt in Rio, or in contemporary Korean church-based weekend health clinics that are found throughout the neighborhood where I do my research. At other times, the public's health is individual or family-based, combining pre- and post-migratory experiences in a kind of commingled disease-slash-cure mixture. Bonchichiro's enduring centrality as a space of public health is a result of the Brazilian state's long-term concern that disease was imported. And when I say long-term, I mean until today. The Ministry of Health built the block-long Disinfectorio Central, these don't exist anymore, the Central Disinfectory in 19th century Bonchichiro on a plot that had previously housed Brazil's first immigrant reception center, Hospitaria dos Imigrantes. The building and its employees were charged with improving health outcomes by chemically sanitizing the tens of thousands of foreigners who were arriving daily into the neighborhood. Today, the Sao Paulo Secretary of Health operates that same building as a museum, archive, and medical warehouse. Across the street, I'll show you some pictures in a section, sits the Bonchichiro Public Health Clinic, a UBS Dubai. It was established when the 1988's constitution inclusion of health as a universal right and state responsibility created the SUS, bringing health care from 4% of the population in 1998 to over 80% of the population today. A remarkable change, and for those of us who live in the United States, something extraordinary. We can hardly believe it that such a thing exists uh, in such a wonderful way. The UBS, the Posto de Saúde in Bojichiro, serves about 65% of the neighborhood's 30,000 residents. And the health professionals who walk the streets in their blue Posto de Saúde vests are part of the local landscape. In other words, they have a spatial meaning in this neighborhood not just a health one. That public health clinic, even though it's new, sits on a lot that over the last century has housed a leprosy treatment facility, a pronatalist education site, and a sexual health center. 
So part of my research is to think about why these spaces of health are constant over long period, periods of time. Policymakers in the press have long portrayed Bonchichiro's immigrant populations as dangerously unhealthy. And it's easy to find contemporary versions of the 1892 complaint from a military health a military official that Bonchichiro was the worst neighborhood in Sao Paulo. In 2016, the press described a Korean immigrant who used a crossbow to murder a poor elderly resident who lived on the street as a person filled with chaiva. This for, means both anger and rabies, right? Chaiva is a really interesting, interesting word. In fact, just earlier this week, I led a group of business school students from my university to, to Bojichiro, and the Brazilian tour guide who was taking care of them refused to go. He was so scared to go into the neighborhood, right? So this is the impression that people have of this neighborhood until today. Just a few months ago, public health officials in the neighborhood identified vaccine, unvaccinated refugees from Venezuela and Orthodox Jews migrating between Israel and Brazil as responsible for a citywide measles outbreak. This weekend, if you're on the metro, the Sarampo vaccination campaign is going to be continuing, and you'll meet my colleagues from Bonchichiro if you go to those stations. What's interesting about all of this is that when you examine disease incidence, prevalence, morbidity, uh, uh, morbidity mortality, over long periods of time since the 19th century, Bonchichiro doesn't look any different than any other central neighborhood in Sao Paulo. So we have an incredible example of an idea about a place that simply isn't supported through medical or social scientific evidence. The desire in Brazil to imprint positive health outcomes on the people is clear in the names that are given to the neighborhoods. Bon Chichiro, Good Retreat, is just one of them. But people from this city know about Campo Limpo, Clean Fields, Saúde, Health, Isionopolis, I don't know, Hygiene City, something like this. And these are all ideas that the elite use to kind of bring health to the public, and they continue, as I said, to this day. At the same time, the population, the public's health, is involved in this story with a constant reaction and negotiation with the state. An example of this is litter. In my historical documentation and in my current ethnographic research, the question of litter, lixo, is constant. Where the lixo is, why it's not picked up, what happens after it rains and they become places for mosquito and born diseases and things. And it's interesting to speak to public health policymakers about this or to read what they thought about it in the past, because it's constantly about how foreigners and the working class don't have a culture of health, right? They blame the population for the litter. When you speak to the actual population, they reverse it. They say the problem is the state isn't picking up the litter. And again, I want to be clear that this is something that as a historian, I have documentation about since the 19th century. And in my current research, we are talking about, as part of uh, Sao Paulo uh, Secretary de Saúde, policies every, every single day. In my research, I see these kind of conviviality, inequality relationships repeated over and over. And I want to give you some examples before I show you some images. The first came in the midst of the 1916 Spanish flu epidemic. It's interesting, gripe española, at a time when we're thinking about uh, viruses and racism that comes out of naming viruses based on locations. At the time in 1916, central disinfectory workers they, they had these mobile disinfectory units, and one of their jobs was they drove around the streets to pick up corpses. 
All right, that was one of the jobs of a healthcare worker in the early 20th century. So one day they were driving along and they discovered a corpse of an immigrant on one of the Bonjichiro streets and brought the corpse to a public cemetery for burial. The following morning, I kid you not, the corpse came back to life. Neighborhood residents were sure that it was a zombie, zombie, right? But health professionals saw it differently, right? We're laughing, it seems funny, but this is really how it works in real people's lives, right? Health professionals said no. The undead foreigner was a case of alcohol dissipating from a bloodstream. In other words, that the guy was drunk off his ass, right? And that as the alcohol dissipated, he returned, okay? This kind of situation, you're, it's funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> it's not funny. Um, this leads in neighborhoods like Bonjichiro's to various kinds of interactions. On the one hand, the state spends incredible effort thinking about drug addiction. In this case, it's alcohol drug addiction. On the other hand, the public does something different. And in Bonjichiro, it led to the sainthood of a 12-year-old child who died of the Spanish flu, died for real uh, from the, the Flanish, Spanish flu, and whose tomb to this day people go to for miracle cures. This case relates to a contemporary one that me and the medical team that I'm on work on all the time. It's the case of a person I'll call Joanna and her son, Vanio, I'm calling them this, this is not their real name, who's a long-term drug addict. He's a crack addict. Joanna does textile piecework in her home. She has a little home and she's sewing stuff all the time to make money. And her son, Vanio, is literally consuming her home by stealing items from it to purchase drugs. During the years I've been observing at the Ubiasi, I meet these people all the time. I meet them on the street, we meet them in clinical circumstances, all sorts of things. And one of the parts of it that's most incredible is that while the state tries to send Vanio for rehab, the mom, Joanna, goes to the tomb of the little boy who died in the Spanish flu in an attempt to get him cured, right? And, I, and I, this is important given our conversation from yesterday because at least in, in my project, we're not treating one as like legit and the other as kind of crazy, right? We're trying to have a respectful relationship with all, all of these possibilities. The second example I wanna give uh, is from 2016, which you might remember had the Zika outbreak here. At that time, I spent two months as part of a health surveillance team uh, from the city of Sao Paulo, Vigilancia Sanitaria, it's called. And the job of the health surveillance team at the time was to go around the city and look for uh, denuncias of wa standing water, right? And it was a, re it was a really interesting experience because we went all over the city, lots of denuncias happen as ways for neighbors to resolve disputes about each other. Things like that, right? So it was like a great experience for me to think about, like how, to, how does health work in the real world? But one day in November of 2016, we were called to inspect a large building in Bonjichiro that's more or less across the street from the public health center. With the health surveillance team, which is all male, wears uniforms and arrives in a car with a farol encima, right? With a light on top. We came up to this big building and we were not allowed in, right? The residents peered out and no one would unlock the door. By chance, by incredible chance, the following day, I was with the health team and we went to the same building as part of the regular pop-up clinics that the health team that I'm on does for people who work in sweatshops. So in other words, the health goes to the sweatshop. The sweatshop doesn't come. This time, we arrived on foot. The team was led by women. 
because all of the healthcare worker, all the healthcare agents on our team are women. And we were instantly welcomed. So again, fascinating here because you see how the state isn't monolithic. Rather, you see two different programs of the state working in different ways. So let me conclude uh, by showing you some images and telling you a little bit about um, ways we're thinking about diminishing this distinction between the researcher and the researched, right? By thinking about research as a partnership experience rather uh, than another one. So the first thing you, you need to know is that I use a team approach. This isn't something that historians normally do. Uh, it's been a great learning experience. I have a team of people uh, from the University of Sao Paulo, the UNIFESPI, Universidade Federal de Sao Paulo, and Emory University. Um, these are graduate students and undergraduate students, and they're from all different areas. Neuroscientists, medical students, sociologists, literature students. And between us, we're able to work in, everybody has to, as a minimum, speak Spanish and Portuguese, but we also work in Chinese, Korean, and Guarani, right? So again, these are ways that we can think about doing research in a, in a certain way. So let me show you about how this works. Here. Ah, okay. So the first thing that's really important is that even though we think of cities as huge, and Sao Paulo is really huge, people's real lives take place in very small areas. So in fact, the focus of our project is on one block. It's the block that has the central disinfectory and the public health clinic. And because we're using historical and contemporary research and spatial analysis, we're able to think about locations on the block over time, even if the street numbers and the buildings change, right? We have a big project with FAPESPI, that's Emory Unifespi e Impi, Instituto Nacional de Pesquisas Espaciais, right? To do this kind of incredible work. And so this is, so when we think about Sao Paulo, this is what we think about. And this is how the people who live in that neighborhood think about Sao Paulo. One of the things we noticed, and even somebody commented to me the other day, is that neighborhoods aren't actually neighborhoods. Neighborhoods are filled with multi-neighborhoods. And as we started doing the research, we started to realize that there are three clear neighborhoods in Bonjachiro. One is today hipster Bonjachiro. It's near the Tiradenchi's train station. It has Korean bubble tea, young people want to live there and it's cool and has and it has lots of cultural institutions another neighbor part of it setorum is commercial it's where you go to buy clothing and where the clothing is made upstairs in sweatshops and setor 3 is very very Poor. Ah, eu falei que eu ia falar em português agora. É mais fácil, né? Então, setor 3 é aquele parte onde tem uma comunidade extremamente pobre, tem cortiços, tem pensões, ou seja, não tem nada a ver com o setor 2. Né? Então, é importante para a nossa pesquisa pensar desse jeito. Né? Parte da pesquisa é medir prédios. E uma coisa que percebemos muito rápido na pesquisa é, apesar da ideia que São Paulo é uma cidade vertical, nos bairros menos ricos não é vertical nada. São casas pequenas, prédios bem pequenos. Então, aqui pode ver a diferença entre, uh, nesse lado, prédios altos, né, onde moram pessoas com dinheiro, E lá, prédios baixos, ou seja, as cores mais, mais leves, que são todos prédios baixos. E isso faz uma diferença, porque quem mora num prédio deste tipo normalmente mora num apartamento onde, por exemplo, onde dormir, onde comer e onde assistir televisão são quartos diferentes, salas diferentes. O outro, mesma sala. Né? Então, isso faz muita diferença. Para quem já foi para Bom Retiro, provavelmente vocês conhecem bem a parte embaixo, as lojas, mas lá em cima, 
Por que estão fechados desse jeito? Porque são todo oficinas de costura meio irregulares, vamos dizer. Né? Aqui, para quem não conhece o que é um posto de saúde, é o um posto de saúde onde trabalhamos. Né? O famoso lixo. Uma das coisas que estamos fazendo é mapeando lixo durante os últimos 150 anos. E o que estamos percebendo é, por exemplo, esse lixo aqui, temos evidências de 100 anos atrás que houve lixo aqui mesmo. Então, isso cria uma pergunta bastante legal né? sobre isso. Uh, então, e para terminar, o que podemos fazer? Né? Uma coisa que estamos fazendo é criando guias multilinguais para agentes comunitários de saúde que podem levar quando falam com a população. Então, aqui é um exemplo de português e coreano. Mas a outra coisa que é mais desafiador é quando estamos, quando precisamos falar com o público. E normalmente, cada seis meses, a UBS, o posto de saúde, pede para a gente, ou para mim, normalmente, fazer uma palestra no meio da rua, em frente do posto de saúde, num espaço público, onde vem drogados, velhos, qualquer pessoa, para ouvir sobre o projeto. E a pergunta deles é... Eles não falam do antropocene, não, não usam essa linguagem. Eles falam muito claramente o que sua pesquisa está fazendo para a gente. Essa pergunta para a gente é muito importante. Né? Estamos passando muito tempo tentando responder cada vez melhor o que estamos fazendo para eles. Então, com isso, vou agradecer a sua atenção.